crack all my fingers here. I hope you hear everything as you should. I won't be streaming for too long today, but I want to read to you Snow White. I've, again, never read it before, had it read out to me, but uh, why are my model's eyes all Monka W? <laughs> okay, let's not worry about that for today. So, Snow White. There once was a queen who had no children, and it grieved her sorely. One winter's afternoon, she was sitting by the window sewing, when she pricked her finger, and three drops of blood fell on the snow. Then she thought to herself, Ah, what I would give to have a daughter with skin as white as snow, and cheeks as red as blood. After a while, a little daughter came to her with skin as white as snow, and cheeks as red as blood. Ah, what can mention well? <laughs> Hope you had a wonderful time, and yes, I did forget to say William Mahoma. This is why I love you for being the moderator. Thank you very much, darling. And cheeks as red as blood, so they called her Snow White. But before Snow White had grown up, her mother, the queen, died, and her father married again. Oh, thank you. It is a bit scuffed at times, especially with the model tracking of the lips and the eyes. But, it's alright. I just have to get it to work into a proper order. And her father married again, a most beautiful princess who was very vain of her beauty, and jealous of all the women who might be thought of as beautiful as she was. Indeed. The eyes. <laughs> I'll recount very quickly here. You'll get to see a bit of scuff. Okay. And let me take all this off. Now that I recalibrated in this position. Okay. Now, let's hope it's better. Okay. A most beautiful princess who was very vain of her beauty and jealous of all women who might be thought of as beautiful as she was, and every morning she used to stand before her mirror and say, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? And the mirror always used to reply, Queen, queen, on thy throne, the greatest beauty is thy own. But Snow White grew fairer and fairer every year till at last one day when the queen in the morning spoke to her mirror and said, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? The mirror replied, Queen, queen on thy throne, Snow White, the fairest thou must own. And let me go quick over here. Then the queen grew terribly jealous of Snow White and thought and thought how she could get rid of her till at last she went to a hunter and engaged him for a large sum of money to take Snow White out into the forest and kill her and bring her back her heart. But when the hunter had taken Snow White out into the forest and thought to kill her, she was so beautiful that his heart fa failed him, and he let her go, telling her she must not for his sake and her own return to the king's palace. Then he killed a deer and took back the heart to the queen, telling her that was the heart of Snow White. Snow White wandered on and on, till she got through the forest and came to a mountain hut, and knocked at the door, but she got no reply. She was so tired that she lifted up the latch and walked in, and there she saw three little beds and three little chairs and three little cupboards, all ready for use. And she went up to the first bed and lay down upon it, but it was so hard she couldn't rest. Then she went up to the second bed and lay down on that, but it was so soft that she could not get hot, too hot and couldn't sleep. So she tried for the third bed, but that was neither too hard nor too soft, but suited her exactly, and she fell asleep there. Ah, welcome in, Meowrick. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the uh, sound alerts isn't working, but thank you for coming in, darling. <laughs> I suppose your uh, Wi-Fi is being too uh, 
strange and you can't uh, really stream well. I think twice. <laughs> my, my, Maverick. Is it your. Oh, hello, Miss Piggy. Welcome in. <laughs> it's great to see you here. And welcome in 1200 or 12,000 gaming. I see you everywhere and yet. Uh, well, just as a forewarning, darling Meowrick, this will be a short stream. I think I'm only going to read a, few, a story or two and then I'll probably end and find someone else to raid and hope they have a wonderful time. And then I'll stream sometime. No idea when, but it'll be fun. And welcome in, Pastel. In the evening, the owners of the hut, who were three little dwarves who earned their living by digging coal in the hills, came back to their home. And when they came in, after they had washed themselves, they went to their beds. And the first of them said, Somebody has been sleeping in my bed. And then the second one said, And somebody's been sleeping in my bed. And the third one called out in a shrill voice, for he was so excited. Somebody is sleeping in my bed. Just ho look how beautiful she is. So they waited till she woke up and asked her how she came there. And she told them all that the hunter had said to her about the queen wanting to slay her. Then the dwarfs asked her if she would be willing to stop with them and keep house for them. And she said she'd be delighted. Until then the next morning, the queen went up as usual to her mirror and called out mirror mirror on the wall who is the fairest of us all and the mirror answered as usual queen queen on thy throne snow white's the fairest thou must not must own ah it is really a beautiful scene you see a beautiful person in the top right corner and you see <laughs> below that <laughs> a certain beautiful gray cat <laughs> oh, thank you, Zany. Now, back to this. And the queen knew that Snow White had not been slain, so she sent for the hunter and made him confess that he had let Snow White go, and she made him search beyond the forest till at last he brought back word that Snow White was dwelling in a little hut on the hill with some coal miners. Then the queen dressed herself up like an old woman, and taking a poisoned comb with her, she went back the next day to the hut where Snow White was living. Now the dwarves had warned her not to open to the door to anybody else, lest the evil might befall her, and she found it very lonesome, keeping always within doors. When the queen, disguised as an old woman, came to the door of the house, she knocked upon it with her stick, but Snow White called out from within, who is there? Go away. I must not let anyone come in. All right, answered the queen. If you can come to the window, we can have a very or have a little chat there, and I can show you my wares. So when Snow White came to the window, the queen said, Oh, what beautiful black hair. You ought to have a comb to bind it up. She showed her the comb that she brought with her. But Snow White said, I have no money, and cannot afford to buy so fine a comb. Then the queen said, That is no matter. Perhaps you have something golden that you can give me in exchange. And Snow White thought of a golden ring that her father had given to her, and offered to give it for the comb. The queen took it and gave Snow White the comb, and bade her goodbye, went back to the palace. Snow White lost no time in going to the beer, her mirror, and binding up her hair, and putting the comb into it. But it had scarcely been her hair for a few minutes when she fell down as if she were dead, and all the blood left her cheeks, and she was snow white indeed. Oh, thank you, darling. Let me uh, scroll up just a bit because my mouse is broken, and all it does is scroll up. <laughs> ah, welcome in, Iggy. Are you having a fun time, darling? <laughs> I do hope you are. When the dwarves came home that evening, they were surprised to find that the table was not spread for them, and looking about, they soon found Snow White lying upon the ground as if she were dead. But one of them listened for her heart, and said, She lives, she lives. And they began to consider what caused Snow White to fall into such a swoon. 
They soon found the comb and they took it out. Snow White soon opened her eyes and became as lively as she ever was before. The next morning, the queen went to the mirror on the wall and said to it, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of us all? Then the mirror said as before, Queen, queen on thy throne, Snow White, the fairest thou must own. Then the queen knew that something had happened to the comb and that Snow White was still alive. So she dressed herself once more as an old lady and took off her poisoned ribbon. Oh, I got burp. I got burp on her, by the way, but get ready for it. <laughs> so she dressed herself once more as an old woman and took with her a poisoned ribbon and went to the hut with of the three dwarves. And when she got there, she knocked at the door, but Snow White called out, You cannot enter. I must not open the door. Then, as before, the queen called out in reply, Then come to the window and you can see my wares. Then Snow White came to the window and said, You are looking more beautiful than ever, but how I'm becoming you arrange your hair. Did you use that comb I gave you yesterday? Yes, indeed, said Snow White, but I fell into a swoon because of it. I am afraid there is something the matter with it. No, no, that cannot be, said the queen. There must be some mistake. But if you cannot use the comb, I will let you have this pretty ribbon instead. And she held out the poisoned ribbon. Snow White took it, and after the old woman, as she had thought, had gone. Ah, oh, mouse! Mouse! You're finally here! Ah, how wonderful. Let me scroll down. And thought she was, had gone away. I know, Mousy Mouse, you finally caught me. How good. And now I can read to you a little bit. And welcome. Uh, and thank you for welcoming Mouse Egghound. Now. No, no, that cannot be, said the queen. Ah, I read that. <laughs> Thought she had gone away. Snow White went to the mirror and tied up her hair with the piece of ribbon, but scarcely had she done so when she fell to the ground lifeless and lay there as if she were dead. That evening the dwarves came home and found Snow White lying on the ground as if dead, but soon discovered the poison ribbon and untied it. Almost as soon as this was done, Snow White revived again. The next morning, the queen went once more to the mirror on the wall and called out, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of us all? To which the mirror replied without change, Queen, queen on thy throne, Snow White's the fairest thou must own. And the queen recognized that once again her plans had failed, and Snow White was still alive. So she dressed herself once more and took of her a poisoned apple, that was so arranged that only half of it was poisoned, and the rest of it was left as before. And when the queen got to the hut of the dwarves, she tried to open the door, but Snow White called out, You can't come in. Then I'll come to the window, said the queen. Ah, you are the old lady that came twice before. You have brought me not but, or you have brought me, you have not brought me good luck. Each time something has befallen me. But the queen said, I do not know how that can be. I only brought you something for your hair. Perhaps you tied it too tight. I'll show you that I have no ill will against you. I have brought you this beautiful apple. But my guardian, said Snow White, told me that I must not take n nothing more from you. Oh, thank you, Miss Piggy. I still have to tinker with this model because the mouth is opening to such a degree it's too large. Oh, this is nothing to wear, said the queen. This is something to eat, to show you that it can be no more or that, to show you that there can be no harm in it. I will take half of it myself, and you shall eat it, eat the other half. So she cut the apple in two and gave the poison half to Snow White, and the moment she swallowed the first bite of it, she fell down dead. Then this queen slunk away and went back to the palace. 
went at once to her chamber and addressed the mirror on the wall. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of us all? And this time the mirror answered, as it used to be, queen, queen on thy throne, the greatest beauty is thine own. Then the queen knew that Snow White was dead at last, and that she was without a rival in beauty. Then the dwarves came home that night and found Snow White lying upon the ground quite dead, and could not find out what happened or how they could cure her. Though she seemed dead, Snow White kept her beautiful white skin and seemed more like a statue than a dead person. So the dwarves had a glass coffer made for her and put Snow White in it and locked it up. She remained there for days and days without changing the slightest, looking oh so beautiful under the glass case. Now a great prince of the neighboring country happened to be hunting near the hill of the dwarves and called at their hut to get a glass of water. And when he came in, he found nobody there but Snow White, white lying in her crystal coffer. And he fell at once in love with her, and sat by her side till the dwarves came home. And he asked them who she was. They told her of her history, and he begged that he might carry the coffer away, so that he might always have her near him. At first they would not do so, but he showed so much that he loved her, so that they would at last yield. And he called for his men to carry the coffer home to his palace. And when the men commenced carrying the coffer down the mountain, they jolted it so much that the piece of poison apple in Snow White's throat fell out. And she revived and opened her eyes and looked upon the prince who was riding by her side. When he had ordered the coffer to be opened, he told her all that had happened, and he took her home to his castle and married her. After this, the queen once more came to her room and spoke to the mirror on the wall and said, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? And the mirror this time said again, Queen, queen on thy throne, Snow White's the fairest thou must own. And so the queen was so enraged, because she had not destroyed Snow White, that she rushed to the window and threw herself out of it and died on the spot. My god, that is horribly demented. <laughs> Why are old fairy tales like this? <laughs> I, I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Let me try and find a very short one. Because I don't think I have much time left. Ah. Uh, I think I'll read The Elves and the Shoemaker then that will probably be the last story I'm able to tell you that one. Oh, well, welcome back, Meowricon. This will be the last story I'll be reading. It's The Elves and the Shoemaker by Brothers Grimm. So let me go to my ASMR screen and change title. Because... in the shoemaker and for some reason the H is capitalized. Bam. Okay. And let me scroll down because it looks like it chatted. Oh, the artwork does have a very nice voice. Now back to this. First story. A shoemaker by no fault of his own had become so poor that he, at last he had nothing left but leather for one pair of shoes. So in the evening he cut the shoe, er, he cut out the shoes which he wished to begin to make the next morning. And as he had a good conscience, he lay down quietly in his bed and commended himself to God and fell asleep. In the morning, after he had said his prayers, uh, and was just about to sit down to begin to work. The two shoes stood quite finished on his table. He was astounded and knew, and knew not what to say. He took the shoes in his hands to observe them closer, and they were so neatly made that there was not one bad stitch in them, just as they were intended as a masterpiece. Soon after, a buyer came in, and as the shoes pleased him so well, he paid more for them than was customary. 
And with the money, the shoemaker was able to purchase leather for two pairs of shoes. He cut them out at night, and the next morning there's and the next morning was about to set to work with fresh courage, but he had no need to do so, for when he got up they were already made. The buyers were also not wanting, who gave them the money without or money enough to buy leather for four pairs of shoes. The following morning, too, he had found the four pairs made, and so it went on constantly that he cut out in the evening was finished by the morning, so that he had soon had his honest independence once again, and at last became a wealthy man. Now it befell that one evening, not long before Christmas, when the man had been cutting out, he said to his wife, before going to bed, What think you if we were to stay up tonight to see who see who it is that lends us the, this helping hand. The woman liked the idea and lit, the, or lit a candle. And then they hid themselves in the corner of the room, behind some clothes that were hanging there, and watched. When it was midnight, two pretty little naked men came, sat down by the shoemaker's table, and took all the work which was cut out before them and began to stitch and so, and hammer so skillfully and so quickly that their little fingers. The shoemaker could not turn away his eyes for astonishment. They did not stop until it was all done, and stood finished on the table, and they ran quickly away. Next morning, the woman said, The little men have made us rich. You, we really must show that we are grateful for it. They run about so, and have nothing on, and must be cold. I'll tell thee what I'll do. I'll make them little shirts, coats, and vests, and trousers, and knit both of them a pair of stockings. And do thou, too, make them little pairs of shoes, the man said. I shall be very glad to do it. And one night, when everything was ready, they laid their presents all together on the table, instead of the cut-out work, and then concealed themselves to see how the little men would behave. At midnight they came bounding in, wanting to get at work at once, but as they had not find any letter to cut out, but only the pretty little articles of clothing, they were at first astonished, and then they showed intense delight. They dressed themselves with the greatest rapidity, putting on the clo pretty clothes on, and singing, Now we are boys so fine to see, why should we longer cobblers be? Then they danced and skipped and leapt over chairs and benches. At last they danced out the doors. From that time forth they came no more. But as long as the shoemaker lived, all went well with him. All of his undertakings prospered. Oh, let me go uh, scroll down here. The second story. There was once a poor servant girl who was industrious and cleanly and swept the house every day and emptied her sweepings into a great heap in front of the door. One morning, when she was just about to go back to her work, she found a letter in the heap, and she could not read. She put her broom in the corner and took the letter to her master and mistress, and behold it was an invitation from the elves, who asked the girl to hold a child for them and its christening. The girl did not know what to do, but at length, after much persuasion, and as much as they told her it was not right to refuse an invitation of this kind, she consented. Then three elves came and conducted her into a hollow mountain, where the little folks lived. Everything there was so small, but more, of, er, more elegant and beautiful than could be described. The baby's mother lay in a bed of black ebony or ornamented with pearls. The cover lids were embroidered with gold, the cradle was of ivory, and the bath was of gold. The girl stood as godmother, and then, and then wanted to go home again, but the little elves urgently entreated her to stay there for three days with them. So she stayed and passed the time with pleasure and, uh, and gaiety, and the little elves did all they could to make her happy. At last she set out her way home. Then first they filled her pockets quite full of money, and after they led her out of the mountain again, they, when she got home she wanted to begin work, and took the broom which was still standing in the corner of her hand, and began to sweep. 
Then some strangers came out of the house and asked who she was and what business she had there. And she had not, as she fought in three days with the little men in the mountain, but seven years, and in the meantime her former masters died. My. Third story. A certain mother's child had been taken away out of its cradle by the elves, and a changeling with large head and staring eyes which would do not but eat and drink, laid in its place. In her trouble, she went to her neighbor and asked her advice. The neighbor said that she was to carry the changeling into the kitchen, set it down on the hearth and light a fire and boil some water in two eggshells, which would make the changeling laugh. And if he laughed, all would be over with him. The woman did everything that her neighbor bade her, and when she put the eggshells with water on the fire, the imp said, I am as old now as the Wester Forest, but never yet have I seen one boil anything in an eggshell. And he began to laugh at it. Whilst he was laughing, suddenly came a host of little elves, who brought the right child, set it down on the hearth, and took the changeling away from them. And that, dearest listener, was the story. Now, I will read to you until it gets to the 30 minute mark because I do want you to at least listen and relax <sighs> hmm. let me see how long the ugly duckling is ooh ugly duckling is long what about the tortoise and the hare ha ah, this is a short one ok let me edit stream information Tortoise in the Hair by Aesop. Ooh. Vega. Thank you so, so much, darling. Thank you. Okay. Now to the story, darling. A hare was making fun of the tortoise one day for being so slow. Do you ever get anywhere? He asked with a mocking laugh. Yes, replied the tortoise. And I get there sooner than you think. I'll run you a race and prove it. The hare was much amused at the idea of running a race with the tortoise. But for the fun of the thing, he agreed. So the fox, who had consented to act as a judge, marked the distance and started the runners off. The hare was soon far out of sight. And to make the tortoise feel deeply feel very deeply how ridiculous it was for him to try a race with a hare. He lay down beside the course to take a nap. The tortoise, meanwhile, kept going slowly but steadily, and after a time, passed the place where the hare was sleeping. But the hare slept on very peacefully, and when at last he did wake up the tortoise near the goal, the hare now ran his swiftest, but he could not overtake overtake the tortoise in time. Slow and steady wins the race. That was rather short, but sweet. Is there another short one I can read to you? The gingerbread man is not a short one. <laughs> the little thief in the pantry? And sure enough, I can read quick. Okay. spelled thief. Oh yeah, I spelled it five. There. A little thief in the pantry. Dear mother, said the little mouse one day, I think the people in our house must be very kind, don't you? They leave such nice things for us in the larder. There's a twinkle in the mother's eye, as she replied. Well, my child, no doubt they're very well in their way. 
but I don't think they're quite as fond of us as you seem to think. Now remember, Grey Whiskers, I have absolutely forbidden you to put your nose above the ground unless I am with you. For kind as the people are, I shouldn't be as surprised if they try to catch you. Grey Whiskers twitched his tail with scorn. He was so quite sure he knew how to take care of himself, and he didn't mean to trot meekly after his mother's tail of his life. So as soon as she curled himself up for an afternoon nap, he stole away and scampered across the pantry shelves. Ah, there was something peculiarly good today. A large pea or a large ice cake stood far back upon the shelf, and the gray whiskers licked his lips as he sniffed it. Across the top of the cake, there were three words written in pink sugar, but as the gray whiskers could not read, he did not know what he was nibbling on at Miss Little Miss Ethel's birthday cake. But he did not feel guilty when he heard his mother calling. He ran off, and his back in the net. He was back in the nest again by the time his mother had finished rubbing her eyes after her nap. She took Grey Whiskers off to the pantry then, and when she saw a hole in the cake, she seemed a little annoyed. Some mouse has evidently been here before, she said, but of course she never guessed that it was her own little son. The next day, the little mouse again popped up into the pantry when his mother was asleep, but at first he couldn't. But at first. He couldn't find nothing to eat at all, though there was most delicious smell of toasted cheese. Presently he found a dear little wooden house, and there hung the cheese just inside it. In ran gray whiskers, but oh, click, went the little wooden house, and the mousie was caught fast in a trap. When the morning came, the cook who had set the trap lifted it from the shelf and then called a pretty little girl to come and see the thief who had eaten her cake. What are you going to do with him? asked Evil. Why, drown him, my dear, to be sure. The tears came to the little girl's pretty blue eyes. You didn't know it was stealing, did you, mousy dear? she said. No, squeaked Grey Whiskers sadly. Indeed, I didn't. The cook's back was turned for a moment, and in that moment, tender-hearted little Ethel lifted the lid of the trap, and out popped Mousy. Oh, how quickly he ran home to his mother, and how she comforted him and petted him until he began to forget his fright, and then she made him promise never to disobey her, and you may be sure he never did. That was the little thief. In the pantry. Now, I think it's time for me to go around, so I'm going to quickly open up a tab here, and I'll find someone quickly to raid. If you have any suggestions of who you wish for me to raid, please just type them in chat. I don't have too many ASMR people here. Oh, wait. I have someone. How good. Hmm. Yeah. Let me go open up. Oh, my mouse just went a little bit odd there. Okay. There. I guess I'll raid this bean. So, if you want to say anything nice to them when we raid, feel free to say whatever. Just be kind and nice. And remember, kindness is always good. There. No problem, you know, right down. Just enjoy yourself. And...